Tell a fellow and thank you guys so much for joining us on another episode of To Night. I'm here today with the beautiful Auntie Tali, Lituli Goez, and Larry Goez. Talo Falava, how are you guys doing? Talo Yeah. Thank you guys so much for having us over. It's a real big honor and a privilege for us to sit here and, uh, and talk stories with you folks today uh, in your beautiful home. And so thank you for welcoming us here. Today, uh, we're, we're wanting to share your story as far as um, how you came about and the things that happened in your life. I might want to start with y your child. If you could just share, Tali, about, uh, Tali, about your childhood and how you grew up, where you grew up, how life was at that time. Well, <clears throat> my, my father, um, you know, Freddie Lee Tuli, we were all born in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. you know, so it's my, my sister Lupe, my sister Mali, myself, my brother Tula and Tui. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all lived in Los Angeles. But when my parents divorced, my mom was Hawaiian. She was a uh, entertainer also. Mm -hmm. And um, she's Hawaiian. Uh, my grandfather was a Hawaiian musician. He played Hawaiian music from the McIntyre family. But when they divorced, we moved to Pango Pango. Mm -hmm. so on Pan American, we flew into Pango for, at the old airport, you mm -hmm. know, back at five in the morning when it arrived. You know, that was in 1963. And uh, we were thrust into the village of Nuuli, which is my grandmother's village. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a culture shock. You know, coming from Los Angeles, and you just watch Chubby Checker mm -hmm. do the twist, to be thrown on a plane to go to Samoa, where you see chickens and pigs, mm -hmm. and you know, it's running free, running free. <laughs> and I was eight, going on nine at mm -hmm. the time. So, yeah, it was kind of a culture shock, and we didn't speak Samoan. Mm -hmm. So being thrust in the village, and back then, I would say in the early 60s, not everybody was bilingual. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, it was hard to adjust when it was just my dad and us, mm -hmm. and then all my cousins, which I didn't really know them. Mm -hmm. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it was kind of a, it was hard to adjust. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother, Falo Tango, she lived on across the village. So my two brothers were separated from us. Mm -hmm. And then we were with aunts and uncles. And mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was kind of hard mm -hmm. uh, because we didn't speak the language. Mm -hmm. And uh, just trying to adjust to that, not having a, my uh, Auntie Tali mm -hmm. because my parents divorced before I was in kindergarten. So Auntie Tali was there to, that's my dad's sister, mm -hmm. to take care of us. And mm -hmm. she wasn't there anymore. So we really mm -hmm. didn't have anybody to rely on. Mm -hmm. So that, that was kind of hard. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure for my siblings too, because I was eight, the other one was nine, the other one was 10. That's you know, very that's, young. That was very young yes. to be thrown in the village. And then all of a sudden you got to do feows. And it's like, what is that? What am I doing? <laughs> it's like, pick up rubbish, you know, mm -hmm. feed the chickens. And, you know, mm -hmm. at first it was, you know, kind of fun, novelty. Mm -hmm. uh, novelty wears off and you got to do the real stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like you got to do it every day. It was, it was daily chores. So what you it was chores. And then mm -hmm. you slowly learn the language and, you know, you had to, you, you try to belong because, you know, a lot of the the village kids would say, hey, if you palang, if you palang. And I thought, not. <laughs> just trying to adjust, right. you know, just trying to adjust. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and then, you know, go to Catholic Church and everything's in Samoan. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wish I retained it. You know, I knew it then, all the Hail Marys, our fathers, everything that was done in Samoan, mm -hmm. all the, all the mm -hmm. prayers, I knew them all in Samoan. But, you know, if you don't do it all the time, you don't speak it all the time, you forget, mm -hmm. you know, so... Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was there until, and then I went to a Palangi school, mm -hmm. you know, uh, all that contract employees, kids, mm -hmm. um, you know, they'd come to Samoa for four to six years, work for the government, whether they were doctors, public works, teachers, mm -hmm. their kids all came, we went to dependent school, 
mm-hmm. which was in between Utule and Fangatongo, mm-hmm. you know, on the way by Centipede Road where the harbor was. Mm-hmm. They and had what a, school is this, Antisana? Dependent school. Dependent school, okay. So you had one classroom of fourth graders and then one classroom of fifth graders and sixth graders. Mm-hmm. So you'd have about, I would say from 25 to 30 kids in one class. Mm-hmm. And we were all half-breeds mm-hmm. and uh, Afghazis and then Palangi kids mm-hmm. in our classes. Mm-hmm. So, and then they opened Fie Law, which was sort of the same thing. Most of the kids, all our teachers were Palangis mm-hmm. and all the kids. I mean, it was very American because mus- uh, when it was music school uh, class, we'd stay in the class throughout the whole day, you know, mm-hmm. lunch and blah, blah, blah. But uh, it was very American. You know, I remember Mrs. Klom in my sixth grade, she would play the piano and we would sing all those American tunes Mm -hmm. that you learn in the 60s, you know, Mm -hmm. and and we did square dancing. Who does that in Samoa? (laughs) Not anymore. (laughs) But, you know, we did dodgeball, tetherball, Mm -hmm. played jacks, played hopscotch. Mm -hmm. Kids don't do that anymore, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, But, uh, I mean, where we lived, you know, no TV, no telephone. Mm -hmm. Lucky if you had electricity. Uh, but you just, you know, as kids, you, you're more um, flexible in that way mm-hmm. because actually you have no choice. Right. And you, you, you get, you know, whatever they serve you, you have to eat it or mm-hmm. that's it. Or you, you know. Right. So, um, yeah, it was kind of hard knocks, you growing know, up in Samoa. growing up in Samoa. Yeah. But uh, you adjust. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so did you graduate from Samoa or did you? Yes, no. I stayed there from fourth grade till I graduated at Samoa High School in 1972. Mm-hmm. And then I um, I knew Samoa was not where I wanted to stay because mm-hmm. what I wanted to do, I knew I couldn't grow mm-hmm. here. And I remember mm-hmm. telling my dad that and I said, Dad, I think I'm not going to grow here, so I'm not going to live here. I think I need to venture mm-hmm. out and see what's out there for mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I left. I was 17 and kind of scary, but exciting at the same mm-hmm. time, not thinking how I worried my dad so much because we didn't have a phone. And mm-hmm. the only way we could communicate was letter, mm-hmm. you know. Right. right. So. So that was hard. So I moved here to Hawaii. My sister Lupe was dancing at the Hawaiian hut at Tavana's at the time. Mm-hmm. And Tavana was an old buddy of my dad. Mm-hmm. So there was small kind of favor for Lupe when she mm-hmm. got in. But yeah, so I stayed with her for a little while until I finally ventured out on my own. And uh, yeah, mm-hmm. and I realized that I needed to mm-hmm. survive. When you left Samoa, you you told your dad that um, you weren't able to grow. What was it that you wanted to do that you could not do in Samoa? Well, I think, um, you know, watching, you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, especially the Haole kids, that were, the Palangi kids that, that mm-hmm. came and they were only there for like four years, three years, six years, you know, mm-hmm. they would all mm-hmm. leave. And, and, I, and I thought, what do I want to do here? Mm-hmm. I don't think there's anything here. I want to do. I mean, while I was growing up, my dad had a, a nightclub called Maoto Ali'i, and Maoto it was on the beach. Mm-hmm. It was kind of a private club, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, the generator, you know, we had the generator set up so the lights mm-hmm. would be on on the beach. They mm-hmm. built, you know, my dad built this uh, kind of modern faleo kind of thing. He had a dance floor and and a, a bar and uh, Pulifana Ngaliai was the band, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. and he would do the oh. show. So my sisters and I would, would dance in the show, but my dad was really strict with us. So they'd have like two shows a night. And then so we'd be stuck in the storeroom. And then when it was time to do the show, we'd come out and do the show and change and, mm-hmm. you know, go back and forth. And then after the show, it's back into the storeroom and we had to just wait there until mm-hmm. the next show. And then, um, when it was time for, um, you know, because you'd have all these people drinking and, and, mm-hmm. and partying and the band playing and stuff. And my we were all underage. So, you know, we're all in high school. My dad did not want us to fraternize with anybody because, mm-hmm. well, you know, 
we shouldn't. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, so you were young and you left Samoa and you had ambition. You knew that you couldn't see it happening in Samoa. What was one of those goals that you had when you arrived in um, per se, America at that time? Yeah, well, you know, mm -hmm. I, in my head, mm -hmm. I know, uh, I remember saying to myself, there's certain things that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And what were those things? And well, I wanted to be a hairdresser because mm -hmm. I used to go to Emily's beauty salon at the Intercontinental Hotel. Mm -hmm. And Emily, she, uh, that was Soli's daughter. Because Soli mm -hmm. had a, a barbershop there and she had a, a beauty salon. And uh, Emily eventually married Jerome Gray. Mm -hmm. You know, loved Emily. She was such a wonderful, um, inspiring person. And I wanted to be like Emily. Oh, you know, I wanted to be a hairdresser. Nice. So, I mean, that's, I kind of applied for a hairdressing school here called Trendsetters. And that's was mm -hmm. my way to come up here, like tell dad, well, right. I'm going to go to beauty college. So that was the way out. That was the way, you know, he said, okay. So I wanted to be a hairdresser and I was kind of good with hair. Oh, you know, cool. I always, you know, would try to do somebody's hair, you know. Right. Back then, of course, you'd have the the updo, the beehive, the kikipua on your head. The you know, yeah, I mean, you know, that was the name they called it yeah. back then, you know, and yes. ringlets and, and the French twist and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So I did a lot. I was really good at uh, updos. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of my goals and I wanted to be a flight attendant. I always wanted to, you know, I watched that old movie Come Fly With Me uh, with all these old actors. It was all mm -hmm. black and white of film back then but that was one of my goals to be a pan american mm -hmm. flight attendant or you know right right and then i wanted to be a beauty queen i thought yeah it'd be great to be a miss mm -hmm. something you know to mm -hmm. achieve that wanted to be a dancer for sure because that was one of my um i always loved to dance mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and i wanted to come here and, and try to Mm -hmm. dance because my parents dance right. you know and I mm -hmm. thought this is something that I I think I would be good at you know and then of course you know wanted to be a, a wife and a mother yes. and um, yes. yeah that was that was and you know believe it or not one by one I, I kind of achieved all those goals mm -hmm. without realizing you know when opportunity comes your way mm -hmm. you know it's like oh okay Mm -hmm. Let's try this. And I tried the beauty college thing, but I needed to make money to survive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, my mm -hmm. parents were so sweet. They would send me $50 a month. Oh, that's, I would have that's to, a lot of money during that time. Yeah, but I would mm -hmm. have, that would have to pay my rent, pay my, uh, my food. Mm -hmm. You can't go far with mm -hmm. 50 bucks, yeah. you know. Uh, so going to beauty college, you know, you do somebody's hair, shampoo and wash and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And the sweet old Japanese lady would leave you 35 cents. And I'm like, oh. okay, I can buy two almond cookies and a passion orange drink. <laughs> that was my that was my lunch. I wish you we could still buy that with yeah, yeah. cents. Can I buy candy with that? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I mean, you learn to appreciate what you have and mm -hmm. you try your best to... Mm -hmm. to uh you know to save your money and to i would not uh, i wouldn't catch the bus i'd walk so mm -hmm. i'd save my quarter mm -hmm. or my dime you know so i wouldn't put it on go on the bus because mm -hmm. even though it's probably easier to just hop on the bus to get from waikiki to king street mm -hmm. where the school was at the time but i needed to eat so i thought i'm gonna mm -hmm. walk i'm not gonna mm -hmm. spend my money on the mm -hmm. bus you know mm -hmm. and then um and I got my uh, my good buddy. He was my classmate. Was uh, Arthur Thompson? That was Tihati's younger brother. Mm -hmm. So he called me up. He said, "Tali, you could come audition for my for my brother's show." Awesome. So I went and audition. That was in '73, mm -hmm. and I, I actually danced at the Beachcomber, and uh, you know, and you learn mm -hmm. what everybody's doing. I mean, because right. you know, there's still uh, that you feel like. Uh, you're not good enough mm. because you don't know enough because you're young, mm -hmm. young and naive. And I was mm -hmm. trying to, I was trying to act like I knew what I was doing, you mm -hmm. know, but also humble enough to just be obedient to the line mm -hmm. captains and listen and observe and mm -hmm. just be, mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that. Can you help me out? You know, right. because I did not I was going to act like, I, uh, you know, but, uh, I had great line captains that helped me at that time, but I still 
you know, then you don't know what's going on in Waikiki, you know, the mm -hmm. things going on in Waikiki, you know, this show and that show and people don't talk to these people and they don't talk to those. And I'm like, mm, what The dancer's I, world. Yeah, what do I do, <laughs> you know? Eventually mm -hmm. I went, I had an opportunity to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. This is 73 and the money sounded really good mm -hmm. and I needed cash. Mm -hmm. So somebody ca uh, called me and asked me, Tali, I think it was Falinico. Mm -hmm. Falinico was working at Zulu's at the time. He was a knife dancer. And because he was one of my dad's students too. Mm -hmm. So there was a connection. Yeah. You know? Right. And uh, he introduced me to this um, to Fia, Fia Moy and Otto Moy at the time. Mm -hmm. That's Tino's parents. Tino's parents. And they connected me with their um, agent. Mr. Awa, I remember, and they needed me to replace another dancer mm -hmm. in Japan. So I went, you know, just a naive country bumpkin from Samoa trying mm -hmm. to make her way to mm -hmm. the middle of nowhere. I mean, it was from, I catch a, you know, plane to Tokyo and then a, a train to Osaka and then another train mm -hmm. to Wakayama Ken in the boonies. But. Wow. I learned mm -hmm. to survive mm -hmm. and do my best. I was just a soloist and mm -hmm. there was a knife dancer. He mm -hmm. did the knife and I did it solo. And we were there for four months. Wow. And wow. you know, mm -hmm. it was a great experience. Went again in 74, because mm -hmm. they really, really liked me. And mm -hmm. I was blessed that mm -hmm. these Japanese loved me. And I learned yeah. to love Japan, oh, you know, great. so that was a great experience for me. You know? So you came with, the, uh, the idea of wanting to succeed in hairdressing and you've done a gazillion things since that time. Since then, yeah. One of those accomplishments was, uh, I believe you were the Miss Amor, you, you went to the Miss Amor, as the Miss Amor to the Miss Universe. Could you share a little bit about that? Well, you know, I in 76, I remember my parents called me and at the time the, um, I guess they had told me that the committee, you know, the Samo had the franchise for mm -hmm. the Miss Universe pageant and you had to have a contestant. Mm -hmm. uh, the year before was Darlene Swanky, who was one of my mm -hmm. buddies, and she had gone to the Miss Universe and where was it? Not Mexico. No, I can't remember where it was. I think it was Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. One of those. Uh, and, and then she went on to be a flight attendant for Pan American. Um, so they called me and they said, we need a con somebody who can walk and talk in like a few weeks. Mm -hmm. We're going to give you the title of Miss Samoa. Mm, okay. Can you handle this? Mm -hmm. And I went, I guess so. You know, you, mm -hmm. a challenge, an opportunity right. was given to me. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, if I can represent Samoa, mm -hmm. I'll do my best. Mm -hmm. You know, so... Pan American at the time sponsored all the all the girls, all mm -hmm. the contestants. And there was like, I think there was maybe seventy six or seventy eight girls wow. from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, given only like two weeks to prepare, you know, I had to give Tavana my. I was dancing in Waikiki at the Moana Hotel, Tavana's mm -hmm. Polynesian Spectacular at the time. So I thought, okay, I don't have super nice clothes to mm -hmm. wear for a pageant. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to be in Hong Kong for three weeks. Mm -hmm. So all the girls let me borrow their their gowns Aww. and their outfits. Everybody was helping me right. out, you know, and shoes, you know. And, um, you know, I was, uh, you know, able to buy a few outfits before I left. And then caught the plane to Samoa and there they, they gave me the title because there was a committee that was put together mm -hmm. and they selected me. I guess maybe mm -hmm. they asked other girls too, but mm -hmm. out of all of them, they selected me. Okay. And um, so they had my sash giving thing at uh, my dad's nightclub that night, mm -hmm. Mao Ali. And um, so Nale Moores and Oliver Moores were the ones running it at the time. And so um, she was, you know, trying to make a gown and trying to make pulitasis for me and mm -hmm. just trying to prepare me for this. I mean, you know, it was kind of overwhelming, but you know, I figured 
I just got to wing it. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm going to just mm -hmm. try to be a good ambassador mm -hmm. for someone. That's all I can say. Right. And, you know, it's not like they had a lot of money to give me. So, you know, when I was at the airport and they gave me this envelope, this, sorry, this is all we come up with. And I went, I'm going to be three weeks in Hong Kong mm -hmm. and $150. Wow. wow. So my dad gave me some money and then they, they sent me some money while I was there. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, we flew from from Pango to Jakarta, to Australia, to Jakarta, to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I got there, you, all the island nations were in one hotel, and then all the other nations were in another hotel. I mean, you're talking like 36 girls in one hotel, 40 in another hotel. That's a lot of girls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, some of the girls had their own chaperones. Oh, <laughs> Tons of feel? Like, uh, yeah. The poor girl from South Wall. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, hey, what the heck? You know, right. just, I'm just, here. I'm here. I'm just going to make the most of it right. you know, and try to yeah. do my best to, mm -hmm. you know, and, and each of us were supposed to bring a gift. Mm -hmm. And so they gave me this huge total. Mm -hmm. carved it was beautiful and mm -hmm. that was my gift and you know back then we didn't have the sky high queen us mm -hmm. so i had uh, my sister made me a small one that was easy to carry mm -hmm. and of course i wore a yekong and it was everything was so tiny you know mm -hmm. my picture on the wall over there mm -hmm. but <clears throat> i tried my best to because i had to take care of myself i had to wear, uh, put myself together and yet a lot of the latino latin nations they had chaperones they had tons of luggage they had big sponsors you know and i was like oh man oh. but you know what what a great opportunity for an island girl from there samoa they didn't even mm -hmm. know where samoa was is it in africa i'm like do i look african <laughs> you know um of course you know when we had the interviews with all the judges i mean you're talking charles jordan fred williamson margot fontaine mm. roman polanski i mean these people you read about or mm -hmm. you've you know that was amazing you know because you're meeting people that you would probably never meet in your mm -hmm. lifetime mm -hmm. and i was i you know to me that was just that whole thing was a great experience and a, and a blessing and a, I wish I was a little more mm -hmm. mature, <laughs> or you know, mm -hmm. you know, not very worldly. I mean, I, I was only twenty-two, mm -hmm. you know, twenty-two, twenty-three, something like that, you know. So it, it was, it was, it was a great experience. Of course, three weeks in Hong Kong was very long mm -hmm. for a pageant. Yes, I could imagine. It can kind of drive you nuts, you know. <laughs> Because every day you have to get up, you have to dress up. And, you know, they were really strict with the, you cannot wear stockings in the bathing suit. Everybody wore the same bathing suit. Mm -hmm. Catalina, one piece. You know, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that, you couldn't smoke, you know. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of those things, you know, you couldn't chew gum in public, you know. So they were really, really strict with that. Anything, mm -hmm. if they did, you know, you'd have to do it on your downtime back at hotel, not, not anywhere in public. Mm -hmm. That's so amazing. There are not many people that uh, have been on a grand stage uh, such as the Miss Universe. So that's that's an accomplishment in itself. And to be able to meet those people. To me, it sounds like you just, uh, when I'm listening to it, it sounds like a girl that came out of Samoa that's very, and you just correct me if I'm wrong and tell me, maybe uh, wet behind the ears, a bit scared, yeah. not sure what to expect. But that also speaks to your ability to overcome some of the challenges you you spoke that uh, money was a was a challenge for you you only had fifty dollars <laughs> and and now we're here right and so what that says is that um there was a lot of endurance and a lot of patience and a lot of um, learning experience that you went through and then you met the man of your dreams. <laughs> yeah. Pray for it. <laughs> She's a woman of my dreams. <laughs> well, I'm glad the feeling is mutual. <laughs> so I just wanted to turn over this time and just uh, speak to Uncle Larry about um, if you could just tell us a little bit about where you're from and how you grew up. So when I, when I met Tali in um, mm -hmm. 1988, uh, last week in February 1988, First week of yeah, March. Yeah, first week of March, because I had the just... First week of yeah, March, 1988. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm born and raised here. Mm -hmm. My background's so different from her. Mm -hmm. You know, strong family, strong uh, 
Catholic, Portuguese, Hawaiian family, mom's mm -hmm. Hawaiian, dad's Portuguese, eight kids all live together in the same house. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, of course, I know Tully's story. Mm -hmm. Can't fathom that because we're one place. Mm -hmm. We're in, we're grew up in Neal Valley on the east side. It was a up and coming valley next to Waikai and uh, mm -hmm. the Thompsons. Nino Thompson's family owned the valley. That's how I got to know Nino. And, but mm -hmm. just a tight neighborhood with uh, the Thompsons, the Spillmans, the Lilas, everybody got, we're just real tight childhood mm -hmm. friends to this and mm -hmm. best friends to this day. So totally different upbringing. Very much sports oriented football mm -hmm. in the main sport of the Gores household. Um, for, for, we were, you know, played football at UA, University of Hawaii, did well, got into the financial service business where I am now. Mm -hmm. And then finally one, one day in about February, Estelle Green, Michael's mm -hmm. wife, says, Larry, there's a young woman we want you to meet. What? Mm -hmm. I don't want to meet anybody. I'm good. <laughs> I'm set. <laughs> I'm set doing my thing. I don't want to meet anyone. And they kept on telling me. And then uh, one day we were at his house with Rich Miano and Nuvaola. Mm -hmm. And of course, Nu knew of Tali. Because I never went, but a lot of times we would take the recruits of the University away. We would take them to the Tiati show, the Tabana show. Mm -hmm. And they all knew in the Samoan community they knew who Tali was, the Tiati girl from mm -hmm. Tiatis. And then they asked me in front of uh, of Nuu and Rich and say, hey, go meet this this guy. I don't want. And then then Nuu goes, Who is this? Oh, this is Tali, Lituli. Tali? Wow, you gotta go meet this girl. <laughs> so Nuu was telling me, You gotta meet her, I'll tell you. Uh, then, long story short, I took I said yes. I said mm -hmm. yes, I'll go meet her. And, like a Wednesday in March. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still remember this, like it was yesterday, went to Ono's Hawaiian Food. Um, uh, we had uh, took Michael and Estelle to eat some wine food. Then we went to the last show at the Princess Kailani Hotel. And I met her. Mm -hmm. And she had mm -hmm. all her friends, I met her in the lobby. Oh, very, very attractive woman, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I had not had a drink for nine years because my, my role at FCA, I didn't think I should be drinking. Mm -hmm. And then she, they did the Tiati number, the number that Tihati and Shaw designed, mm -hmm. where they carry yeah, the Tahitian number, and they carry the woman out on the and four guys coming out. Okay. And there was Tali. <laughs> <laughs> and she got on the stage, dropped the pedals, and did the Tiati number. Mm -hmm. And we were front row center. Mm -hmm. And it was time for the second drink, the second order. My first was a Sprite. Mm -hmm. Second one says, Sir, what would you like for second drink? And without <laughs> hesitation, and the Lord knows my heart. I'll take a Heineken. <laughs> the Lord knows my heart. I'll take a Heineken. And that whole like, view changed your mind. Because <laughs> it was just, I was so nervous. Right. And Michael, with his, with his just a gift of gab, just a brilliant attorney that he is, mm -hmm. said, I would too have a drink with you as well with her. <laughs> and, and, and then making a, a long story, a, a, a story even shorter, in a nutshell, Met her in March, March 2nd, I believe, mm -hmm. of 1988. Mm -hmm. We got married April 23rd, 1988. Right? So, wow. I, 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 being a Christian, being just in her her faith and her family, mm -hmm. uh, in April, I said, you know, uh, you know, by then I had my own place in Palola. I said, you know, I just I can't shack up, like a better term. And I never did. And she said, I, I never, and I she never, never did. did that too. Mm -hmm. I can't either. He said, would you, you know, would you marry me? He said, uh, yes. He said, yes. Right. He said, I know it's good, but why don't we get married in September? Mm -hmm. She then called her dad back in Samoa. And her dad was, she was the only one who wasn't married. Mm -hmm. Everyone else, all the kids were married. The, the, mm -hmm. this is, she was the only one. And dad was always somewhat concerned, living in Waikiki mm -hmm. by herself. But, but, but then she was in her early 30s. Mm -hmm. And um, so she told uh, Olo, Dad, I met the man, I think I'm get married. I'm mm -hmm. get married in September. And he said, why wait? Why not come to Samoa, get married on our beach? Mm -hmm. And uh, so in, a, in, a, in, a, in about a week and a half's time, two weeks time, we left Hawaii. We went to um, a Samoa, first time I ever been there. Mm -hmm. Took two of my brothers with me. My brother Lane right above me, my brother John. Mm -hmm. They were going to be my witnesses, best man. Mm -hmm. And um, then he married us uh, along with a pastor from uh, Assembly of God Church. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, we got married on Freddie's Beach. What's the name of the beach? The real beach. It's Freddie's Beach. Yeah, we got married right right on the beach. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We were, okay. You want to massacre? <laughs> 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 no, he, it just met it, fell in love. I just, uh, okay. I just fell in love with my father-in-law. Yeah. He became the favorite son-in-law. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the minute I met him, I saw what a great man. Mm-hmm. When you learn his story about what he did, mm-hmm. you can't fathom that just to leave as a young boy with nothing to mm-hmm. the States and create the Fire Night Dance, act in his movies with, mm-hmm. with not even the, just only spoke his Samoa and learned mm-hmm. English as he went. Just phenomenal story. And then I knew why she was so close with her dad. But he married us, and it's uh, <clears throat> a little bit, of heaven, little bit uh, part of heaven ever since. Mm. And we've been married. <laughs> oh, that's uh, about 34 years 34 in a- years. next month, uh, in April. Yeah. And it's still years. going strong. Yeah. <laughs> it went strong. We had two yeah. children named Tali and Larry. We're <laughs> <laughs> not too original. <laughs> Simple is the word. Right? With your names. I like your name. I'm a Tali. <laughs> so Tali and Larry did. Mm-hmm. I always wanted a Larry because I'm named after my dad. And, oh. And so, um, so when Larry came along, we said, okay, Larry. Larry. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, Larry, where did you go to high school, Uncle Larry? Where did you so go to I high was school? So I was the first of the eight of us that got accepted to Okay. I left Kamehameha. Uh, just whatever didn't agree with me. I'll be in class of '77. Mm-hmm. Still, my uh, good friends from my man, but I'll probably say I'm a graduate of Kaiser High School. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Kaiser awesome. High School. My dad was we're a big football family, mm-hmm. and the Lee brothers were just taking over at Kaiser High School. Ron Lee was the head coach. Kel Lee was the defensive coordinator, and my dad said, "When you go to Kaiser, you can play for the Lee brothers." And and we, of course, he. I never so knew well. Kel Lee was in. Yeah, and Kel Lee was oh. also, Kel was my defensive coordinator at Kaiser, mm-hmm. one of the greatest coaches I've ever played for. Oh. And Ron was the head coach. Mm-hmm. He was the offensive coordinator, just mm-hmm. had a great time at Kaiser. Mm-hmm. Probably too good of a time, but it's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I know that we spoke and um, just um, seeing you share about Olo, uh, Olo, Tali's, Auntie Tali's um, father. I really would love for you folks, if you could share just a little bit about, um, we know him very, we, well, we know of him very well uh, as the creator of the, the fire knife, um, putting fire onto our, our Nifoti. Um, but if you could share a little bit about who he was as a person and his drive, because what I'm hearing is if he left at a very young age to go out into the America. That's a very scary oh, time. Yeah. And so this is, you're like a mirror of that, that you left, when you left, when you had to leave and you conquered some of those uh, obstacles. Because the Palangi <clears throat> world, not, it's not saying anything about Palangi world, yeah. but the Palangi world and the Samoan village is two absolutely different arenas. <laughs> If you could kindly share about um, the film with Aolo and um, and your relationship with your father. And- uh, you know, that's one thing about my dad. You know, even when we were up in the mainland, you know, he worked hard for us all the time, you know. I mean, because there was five of us, like, right in a row. And then I guess my mom, my biological mom at the time, you know, she she was young. She's She was 15 years younger than my dad. Mm-hmm. So, you know, she was always in her 20s when she had all five of us. Mm-hmm. And I think in her mind, it's not what she, mm-hmm. you know, she was ready for. Mm-hmm. But dad was always there. You know, so I would say my dad was my anchor. I mean, he, you know, he was always there. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, when you know you always have somebody who has your back, dad was that mm-hmm. person. Mm-hmm. And, you know, dad was always so loving and kind and generous. And he was so kind to everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, dad was just a real nice guy. Mm-hmm. He was nice to everyone. And, you know, when people talk about my dad, fondly about how generous dad was and how giving and, mm-hmm. and he was willing to help so many people. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, Malosi Lingi just passed away this past 
oct last October. Everybody, everybody always tells me that, you know, dad was the one that helped him mm -hmm. become who he became. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, he always said great things. Falanico always says great things about dad. You know, a lot of the young people in Samoa, now mind you, dad had, he left Samoa. Well, <clears throat> his dad died when he was like maybe two. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mm -hmm. mean, so... Uh, the matriarch of the family was, you know, who was Misilangi, which is dad's dad's <clears throat> mother. Mm -hmm. And her brother, uh, Pili Lituli, was the Lituli in Nuuli at the time. I mean, not Nuuli, in Ili'ili. Mm -hmm. And then she was married to Olo Angyangi, who was the Olo in Leone. Mm -hmm. So that's how we're all connected with the Lituli. And, mm -hmm. and then now that my grandmother was a Tango. Mm -hmm. So from the village of Nuuli. Nuuli. Mm -hmm. So, um, but Faia took care of my dad. She mm -hmm. raised my dad. Mm -hmm. And she claimed Fongongo mm -hmm. back then. She was a, I would say she was a visionary, a woman beyond her years, because she wanted to make sure that all of Fongongo, this certain portion, I think it was 40 acres, she made sure she registered it with the Navy at the time mm -hmm. in Samoa. It's all, we have it in, all, we have all the papers for it. Mm -hmm. She raised my, my dad until he was maybe 12, and then she passed. Mm -hmm. So my dad was 12 without any supervision. And right. he used to, he said he would go to school at Poyer School in, in Poyer. Pamo. Uh -huh. You know, so he would get his tire and his <coughs> stick and he would do that all the way on the coastline to get to mm -hmm. school mm -hmm. and to come back. Oh. That's far. Mm -hmm. That would probably take hours just to go when you think about it, you know. Mm -hmm. But he had a mean uncle that was just treated him really, really bad. So dad, dad knew that this is not his destiny. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of his teachers at Poyer School was Pulifano's dad. Oh, wow. Yeah, Pulifano's mm -hmm. dad was one of his teachers at the time there mm -hmm. at Poyer. <clears throat> and dad used to always catch on to all the dances. And, and Pulifano's dad <laughs> dad would say that, you know, he would always encourage him to dance. Because dad was just talented. Mm -hmm. So he would watch movies and he'd always imitate the dancers mm -hmm. like Fred Astaire. Mm -hmm. So Fred Astaire was one of his most popular he loved Fred Astaire so he'd always mimic Fred Astaire so he ordered from Sears and Roebuck uh, a tapping uh, mm -hmm. kit that you can order back then you get a box with tapping with those metal things put on your shoes mm -hmm. so he would tap dance and stuff like that you know and oh, so everybody used to call him you know back those days they would call him Freddy that's how he got the name Freddy from Fred Astaire yeah. oh yeah so that's how dad, that's what that was his stage name. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so easier to say Freddy Letuli than Uluwa Misilangi Letuli. <laughs> you know, so it's, yes. it's a mouthful if you're a, a Westerner, a mainland mm -hmm. guy, you know. And dad hardly spoke any English, so him and, him and his friend, uh, I think it was Harrington is the last name, so related to Al Harrington. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They stowed away on one of the uh, Merchant Marine boats, mm -hmm. but he got sick not my dad his friend mm -hmm. he couldn't let him just mm -hmm. get sick so he had to go above and say you know we stowed away so when they were here in hawaii they were in the uh, in the brig right so they had to send him back to samoa <gasps> yeah send him back to samoa wow yeah. <laughs> and then you know the mm -hmm. next time he came through he came through legally and mm -hmm. uh, ended up uh, being on the Merchant Marines and traveling through the Cook Islands and a lot of uh, other places. And they were stuck in Aitsutaki, which is Cook Islands. And they ended up uh, working there for a while. And so in payment, the, uh, the people gave him pearls. Mm -hmm. So when they came back to, when he finally came back to Honolulu, him and his friends, they, they had a bag of pearls and they didn't know the value of the pearls. So they catch a cab and they give them a pearl <laughs> do this. And finally they were down Prices to like a couple of pearls. And uh -huh. then when finally somebody said, 
do you know how much those things, you know, how much the value of it? They didn't realize it. You know, I mean, you know, right. island boys, when somebody gives you something like that where you know, I could probably dive for it, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, my dad, you know, when I think about the adventures that he went growing up without a father mm -hmm. and uh, and without a mother, too, because grandma followed, she she ended up uh, going back to her village in Uli mm -hmm. and remarried. <coughs> she had my Auntie Tolly with her. And I'm sure it was hard for my Auntie Tolly to, mm -hmm. to live without a father and then her mother's remarried. And, you know, it was a hard time for her, mm -hmm. too, because she... She was a strong woman. She was mm. strong uh, with a mean <laughs> yeah. streak. I mean, the village, the guys in the village were scared of Auntie Tolly. She beat mm -hmm. the heck out of my, everybody. You know, she was mm -hmm. one of those. But, you know, dad eventually made his way over here. And, you know, he was just so talented. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my my dad, I must say about dad, when he was, he was dancing, uh, he took flamenco dancing, tap dancing, ballet. And... When he put together, you know, the slap dance, mm -hmm. he put it into a um, a segment where it was uniformed. Mm -hmm. You know, every, everybody can slap away, but there's no mm -hmm. routine. Right. You, you need mm -hmm. a routine to make it work. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you could just slap and hooey, hooey, ayayuli, and do whatever. Mm -hmm. But dad put it into a form mm -hmm. where it was what it is today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, watching a little of the Irish clog hoppers, you know, where you kick the leg and hit it over here and and then a little ballet, a little flamingo. And, and then he said, growing up, he remember, you know, no nua tongi a tongi e. You needed a call. You needed something to start it. I mean, you know, that's mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. people, creative people do. They think, okay, I got this routine. I need a, I need a, 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 a something to, to start it off. So he said when he was growing up in the village, they used to throw nonu all, all of a sudden. Nonu, atongi, atongi, eh, atongi. And then you would throw the nonu, you know, back and forth, back and, you know. <laughs> it's like Ivea, and you do Ivea, you know, that sort of thing. So that's how he came up with the, you know, when they first start doing mm -hmm. the night, I mean, the slap back in the day. You know, and they uh, uh, yeah. it'd be a routine, uh -huh. you know, and that's how the form of the slap came to what it is today. Of course, now everybody's taking it to another level and they have their own slap routines and which is great because mm -hmm. that's, that's what you do with everything. Mm -hmm. With any form of dance, you take it to another level. I mean, even a knife mm -hmm. is gone to a lot of baton twirlers. They use mm -hmm. a lot of, and that's fine too. Mm -hmm. But you know, the traditional Mm -hmm. You know who the traditional knife dancers are when you watch the way they do the the Samoan routine, mm -hmm. the Samoan twirls. The, there's certain, you know, compared to, I mean, I love what everybody's doing. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, to me, you know, being creative is great. Mm -hmm. Just don't, you know, don't forget your base. Where it started from. Where it started from. I mean, right. to me, as long as you know the base, yeah, the you base. could take it anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, it, right. you know, like Kahiko, mm -hmm. you, you, that's the base. Mm -hmm. You could take Awana anywhere. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think that goes for any form of dancing. You have your base, which mm -hmm. is, especially for us, because we're cultural people. Mm -hmm. And, you, you, you know, and without history, you're never going to know that. Mm -hmm. And I think people as, you know, as Polynesians, we, we, we always have to teach our children our history and how it, mm -hmm. where it really came from and never forget and, and not deviate from the true story of how it really started. Mm -hmm. And it took pioneers like my dad mm -hmm. and other Samoan pioneers like the Moy family. Mm -hmm. They've traveled the world sharing the culture, you know. Mm -hmm. they, they're all pioneers like mm -hmm. Nonosina. Their pioneer, you know, old lady Nonosina, you know, Stella, she was a pioneer in doing what she did mm -hmm. to take it to the level that it is where mm -hmm. the Tahitians are impressed at yes. what they've done. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, right. I mean, you challenge your own, you, you challenge another culture's, uh, mm -hmm. like, well, I hate to say it, but a lot of someone's just so talented. We could do everything. <laughs> <laughs> you could say it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, so, you know, I think my dad, you know, to do what he did as, as someone who 
not a you know hardly anything in his pocket and mm -hmm. trying to make a life of himself and mm -hmm. you know without a father or mother and, and just kind of mm -hmm. but it had a vision mm -hmm. you know and it had a dream mm -hmm. and you know his faith in god was very strong mm -hmm. dad was you know his faith was and i, I think that sustained him mm -hmm. through all of this was mm -hmm. knowing that god is on the throne for you know my dad you know okay. and mm -hmm. i you know and there is um there's things that I constantly hear from sharing dad's story is his perseverance. Um, his, just like yourself, NCN, as well as your Uncle Larry, the ability to come from humble beginnings and, um, and really overcome the challenge. And one of the things about coming from American Samoa or maybe from Samoa or even from Tahiti or Fiji is um, we're entering a world that we really don't know. Mm. So the courage that it takes to, um, to be in that time without the financial means to do things, you really rely on um, that foundation that, that, that you had or you probably don't have or it's just something that you already have instilled in you. And so that's, that, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's... Um, there is a generation now, we, we were in a different time, in a different place now. A lot of our uh, Polynesian kids now, Pacifica kids nowadays, or children have um, access to um, many opportunities. What would uh, you, you both say uh, to those uh, Pacifica kids who are, who are growing up with the amount of opportunity that we have? Um, what would your encouragement be for, for them? Knowing the old man, uh, Olo, may he rest in love, and, uh, and, you, and both of your journeys uh, through, through your times, and maybe for us, maybe um, with Italian, in a foreign land, that's become our home, Hawaii is our home. What would we, um, what would we say to them? I'll start with you, Ancestali. Well, <clears throat> I think, you know, um, there's so many opportunities out there and don't let an opportunity pass you by. Mm -hmm. If you have an opportunity, you know, that you're passionate about mm -hmm. and that it's something that you know that you really love. I said, you know, don't let it pass you by, you know, and take, you know, take the challenge because, you know, for every step you take, you'll fall, mm -hmm. but just get up, dust yourself off and keep going because you're not, not gonna learn if you don't. Mm -hmm. If you keep running back home or you keep taking two steps back or you, mm -hmm. you allow, uh, uh, you know, your uh, fear of lack of knowledge or lack of confidence or lack mm -hmm. of anything, because we all have insecurities, mm -hmm. you know, even as we grow older, we still have that, mm -hmm. you know, there's all that, there's all always that little thing like, oh God, I'm not good at that, or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, you kind of just like, oh, well, I'm just going to try it anyway, because, you know, I'll never know unless I try, right. you know, so I say go for it, because you'll never mm -hmm. know unless you try. Mm -hmm. Any opportunity, any challenge that comes your way, if that's what you want to do, at least you know, am I really good at this? Mm -hmm. And if you go and find out, you know, this is not my gift, <laughs> move on to the next. I mean, you know, but right. at least you, mm -hmm. you say, you could say, you know, hey, I tried it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, didn't turn out for me, but at least I tried it, you know, but you have to give yourself enough, uh, you know, you know, just enough confidence to say, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to try this, mm -hmm. you know, and I hope that, you know, my story can encourage those because I'm not saying everything was easy that mm -hmm. came my way. I fell many times, you know, and uh, audition and never got in. And I'm like, mm -hmm. wow, okay, I'll move on. <laughs> you know, try harder. Try yeah. harder next time or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever they want, you know, I, it's not me now, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever interview you do. I mean, to me, whatever you do, whether you're good in it or not, do the best that you can do as a person. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a janitor, be the best janitor. Mm -hmm. If you're the maid, be the best maid. If you're the dancer, be the best dancer. Mm -hmm. If you're the best this, just whatever, whether mm -hmm. it's a menial task or a great, you know, you're in a great position to, to lead, do the best that you can do because, 
you know, God gives us all an opportunity to take that. Mm -hmm. And if it's part of his plan for you to do that, he will fulfill your plan mm -hmm. when it's your time. His mm -hmm. timing in your life is perfect. And, yeah. Thank you. Uncle Larry? Well, you know, this is just a question. You know, just that's why I was so amazed at my father-in-law mm -hmm. uh, for no internet. His dream was to do what he wanted to based on these movies. Uh, that's all I could think of. He saw, I want to do the, I want to do that. What Fred Astaire is doing. I want to be on the movies. Mm -hmm. But to have that thought in American Samoa, you know, in a village like, city, village city with no, no possibility beyond that, mm -hmm. I'm going to get this done. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think that's the key is to dream, mm -hmm. not just dream like. Not wishful thinking, kind of like what Tully said. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in a house where my dad was my hero. Mm -hmm. You know, just worship mm -hmm. my dad and my mom. Mm -hmm. But my mom knew all of us wanted to be like him. My dad mm -hmm. was well known. But it was that, and he did, you know, he he, he just accomplished things, right? Mm -hmm. And he always told me, just set your mind on doing something, but have mm -hmm. a plan on how to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But don't, don't confine yourself. Mm -hmm. You can do anything. You want, and he really, he really told us that, Dad, I'm on the, I'm on defense alignment. I just, mm -hmm. that guy's way bigger than me. No, you can beat that guy. So he, he's not older, he's stronger. <laughs> he's stronger, he's bigger, he's faster. Mm -hmm. You can beat him, right? Mm -hmm. He's also up here. And he was firm belief that it's all, you know, the heart, but it's all up here. Right. And um, I, I, I think of my father and, and, and Olo, it's just, it's that idea to dream, but didn't have a plan. Mm -hmm. And and that's why I think I think for young people just to think just really think out of the box. And here we are today, mm -hmm. internet. They, we have so many outlets. The, the, right. the good and bad. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good and bad. Like the opportunity is endless. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And, and 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 have that to be able to dream and think out of the box. But have, you got to have a plan. Mm -hmm. you can't just wish. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, I can do all things through mm -hmm. Christ who strengthens mm -hmm. me. That's my model. Mm -hmm. Whatever that, you know, that's our model. Mm -hmm. uh, but but just to have that dream and have that plan to set forth. Same thing I tell my kids. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Right. Don't see, you know, don't see yourself being here. And the, everybody says never be satisfied. Well, I think satisfaction is good. Mm -hmm. but, but always try to improve yourself. Always mm -hmm. try to do better. And not just for you, but for others. Because mm -hmm. and and. And not have that just me attitude, a self attitude, but it's mm -hmm. just the helping others, helping everyone around you. And I think that's um, great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's the well, thing I can think of. If there's one thing that I hear from from the both of you is really um, having that um, the heart, having the vision to foresee your dream, yeah. having a plan, but also even what anti Italian. Um, and having the heart, putting in the, the work yeah. to make sure that those things come to fruition. And so you both are simply a testimony of how we came from American Samoa or we've come from our, or from humble beginnings. And not to say that we haven't, we haven't, uh, you, you both haven't uh, kept the humility, but making sure that if you share that knowledge with our with our young folks that if you have the heart you have a vision you have a plan and you work at it that anything is possible yeah and i, I would add i remember when i graduated mm -hmm. from university where i had my finance degree mm -hmm. i told my dad I said that you know i think i want to be a police officer he was mm -hmm. a police officer my brother I said and nothing is my, my whole family's family is full of police officers mm -hmm. My dad said, no, you need to go to college. Mm -hmm. Get a finance degree to be a police officer. Mm -hmm. now, and he said, I'm a, nothing wrong with being a police officer, but there's so much more. You, and then he told me, there's mm -hmm. so much more you can do. Mm -hmm. There's so much more you can do beyond mm -hmm. just being a police officer. Nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But he, he said, you got the tools. Mm -hmm. You got a finance degree. You're very good. Mm -hmm. I'm very proficient in math. Mm -hmm. You have to use it to your ability. Right, you know? right. You know, don't use it. You know, and, and, and that was just a great mm -hmm. advice back then. I, I like that. I think that sometimes people, uh, and then I'm just sharing with you, I think that sometimes our generation where we're growing up, especially if they're, uh, we're, we're a multicultural island with many different um, 
people, cultures, and ethnicities. And sometimes our brown kids can sometimes feel intimidated yeah. by, um, mm-hmm. say, the Asian kid or maybe the Balan mm-hmm. kid. Or, and so to have that ability to say, hey, I can do this. Uh, we, sometimes we're not given that, um, that chance, right? But what you both are saying is you need to give yourself that chance. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And believe that. No, it doesn't matter what the stereotypical is about mm-hmm. Samoans or Fijians or Tahitians. Or you're just as good. Like your dad said, you can beat them. Yeah. Yeah. You can yeah. get out there and you exactly. can do it, right? And so we want to just thank you both uh, today for sharing your story with our Pasifika people and really bringing some insight to the journey of your life. And I think through the journey of both of your lives and your the family that you have now um, is really going to um, speak to our generation. And when I listen to Auntie Sally, I feel like I'm hearing the same thing from Uncle Larry, was the will to survive. Yeah. We, you had that will and you just pushed forward and kept going and kept going and kept going. And thankfully, we're here today where we're at and we're able to bless, like you said, Uncle, we're able to bless our, our kids and then we turn bless those around us as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we want to thank you both for the opportunity to share with, um, thank you. with us today. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we only hope and pray that the Lord continues to bless both of you, mm-hmm. that you may, he may give you both many more years for life on earth. Uh, to, uh, to serve him yeah. as well as to serve our family, Amen. our people, and our culture. Yes. And so I'll say to the lava. Thank you. Thank you. I want to just say thank you all for uh, joining us today as we share with uh, Aunt Sally and Uncle Larry uh, the Tuli Goez as uh, we're able to speak to them. We want you to tune in as there will be more of our Pacifica stories told by Pacifica people directly to you. Bye-bye.